Uh, yesterday, it, it emerged that a school has backed down after encouraging children as young as 11, uh, so year seven uh, age group onwards, to wear full-blown drag for Pride Day. This was the New Mill School in the Peak District in Derbyshire. Um, they um, uh, had a drag and rainbows themed non-uniform day uh, planned uh, for uh, June the 16th, uh, i.e. to uh, in, in eight days' time, um, uh, to mark June being Global Pride Month. In a letter to all parents, the school said, we are encouraging all students of all genders to wear something rainbow or colourful on what is the, what it is calling Pride Day. They may express themselves by doing something small, like wearing a tutu, makeup, or painting their nails, or to going all out in full-blown drag. Well, not surprisingly, there was something of an outcry from parents uh, and now they have backed down on that and scrapped the idea. Well, let's talk about that and all of these issues uh, with Shivani uh, Dave, who is a journalist and presenter on Virgin Radio. Good morning to, to you, Shivani. Hey, Julia. Happy Pride Month. Yeah, it's not a thing. I mean, this is the thing. I don't, I don't acknowledge any of these these things at all. I find it all quite bizarre. Um, many of my gay friends, indeed, many of my straight friends, when we go to Pride festivals, fill your boots, have a great time. But what on earth has this got to do with children? And what has drag got to do with Pride as well? Because Pride for me, and certainly I knew you know, gay men and women of, of my generation and older, was about it being safe and acceptable and welcome for people to be open about who they were to come out and live their life freely and you know and being able to you know marry and hold hands with the person they love and not face abuse or, or violence and thank goodness me we do now live in a country where that is pretty much largely the case it had nothing whatsoever uh, to do with dressing up um in a in a, a, a caricature of of female you know, a drag, you know, with, you know, fake boobs and nails and hair. What, what has that got to do with gay pride? So <clears throat> drag is traditionally an art form that is uh, usually celebrated in LGBTQ plus communities. And there is such a clear link to drag and gay pride or pride, as we just call it m more commonly now, I think. You will know, I'm sure lots of people will know, that Pride uh, began with the Stonewall Uprising when police raided the Stonewall Inn a pub where lots of gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender people went to sort of have some downtime. And the police were raiding that place and they arrested, I think it was 13 or 14 people um, on the basis of violating the gender-appropriate statute. So that basically, gender-appropriate clothing statute, which basically meant people who were born women or born men dressing up in things that were mm -hmm. for men or for women. Things like trousers or yep. a blazer, that kind of thing. And actually, the person who really started to, or is credited to really kick off a lot of the activism for the uprising at the Stonewall Inn is a lesbian woman called Stormy. And she um, was a lesbian, uh, she was born a woman she lived her life as a woman um she was credited to be like a protector of women mm. and uh she was also a drag king so drag isn't just about dressing up as it, a caricature in the way that lots of people in the me in the media okay no i okay I, I would accept that it's sort of almost like part of that culture i accept that i've gone to drag shows i've been to parties where you know the drag acts are part of the entertainment absolutely great fun I don't know why anyone would think it was appropriate for children when we know that it is different from someone, say, dressing up as a clown or, you know, having someone dressed as a mermaid at your kid's birthday party because actually a lot of it is very sexualised. We're seeing, I mean, certainly on social media, some very disturbing videos coming out of America in particular where this is being pushed, drag story time and the like, but, but drag acts with overtly sexual puns in their name. That's a... I, mean, I used to go to JoJo's in, in Soho many years ago and that had drag acts and again, part of the fun was they would have a name that was when you know when you actually you thought about ah oh, actually it's a it's a sexual pun this is this has no place in schools in nurseries i mean i know somebody who's gender their, their nursery for their two-year-old um they've got whole pride month they've got rainbow flag they this that. i i don't understand what this has got to do with educating children you know when you know on this day we're marking this and on this day we're marking that and i'm thinking when is eating crayons and and, and getting messy in the sandpit day. That's what children should be doing at nursery. Why, I think, why does I this think... ideology, why does this have to be 
So why does it have to be so? I mean, people use this phrase, but push down people's throats day in, day out. We say it's Pride Month. I mean, it's Pride, it's Pride decade, for goodness sake. I think um, crayons and sandpit day should hopefully be every day uh, for, for children in, in nursery schools. Um, so yes, there is a certain level of drag where there are adult entertainers who will perform maybe something scandalous or, or provocative, and that is for an adult audience. Those kinds of events will be running at nightclubs where people will be ID'd okay. to be able to enter. The drag queen in this case, who, who has been running Drag Storytime here in the UK, is called Ada HD. And she talks about mental health. Ada HD is a reference to ADHD. And um, she, her, what she is doing is nothing like what you might be seeing if you go to some of the nightclubs in Soho on a Saturday No, but we, we, have, we have seen, and this comes over from America, this was not a thing. We never needed people to be in drag to go and talk to our children about mental health, you know, even five years ago. Well, I think actually mental health is, is something that is uh, being talked about more and more. And I think actually, it's talked about way too much, personally. Well, I, I, I don't know if I agree with that, but I think what I would say is drag, the British history has an incredibly long lineage of drag history. We've got panto dames. Drag can be traced back to the UK all the way back to Shakespearean times. So there is this incredible connection there that we have with British culture, British history, which should be, I think, celebrated. And part of that is expressed in a way of also being able to play okay. with what it means to be who you are. Yeah, okay, look, I, and I accept the Panto remark, and I accept the history and Shakespeare, I accept all of that. However, isn't it weird that until the trans ideology started dominating everything in our culture and our education the last few years, that this wasn't a thing in our schools? If it had been a long part of our history, you'd, you'd think that that would have been something that had crept in somewhere to story time uh, in our schools and, and, and our libraries, but it hadn't. Um, do you, I, mean, I think that hadn't hadn't been the case because of Section 28, which was a local authority act, which yeah. meant that uh, local authorities couldn't promote same-sex yeah. relationships. That was under Margaret Thatcher, yeah. and that was scrapped that, in that was, in England and Wales. And it yeah, was but it was that, yes, exactly. It wasn't was actually terrible. Yes, yes, but it wasn't actually. Yeah, I, I totally disapproved of Section 28, and, well, and argued against it at the time. However, um, that you know, that that's a small part of our history. You'd think this would have been around for longer. The reality is, there are an awful lot of parents, and I was in my daughter's school only this week at a meeting talking about the PSHE or PHE, I never know what it's called, but the edu sex education lessons and about what we thought they should be taught about, whether it was sexting, worrying about, you know, violent porn, but also I raised the issue of, you know, what advice they're given and what uh, the discussions they're having on, on things like trans issues. Because there are a lot of parents who are perfectly open and welcome, who've got no issue at all, their children are, are gay or straight or bi and really open health, who are genuinely concerned that this is now a a political ideology that is being pushed and a culture that's being pushed that is not necessarily um, a healthy one for our children to know about. It's highly sexualized. It's it's about mental health. It's telling children that it's perfectly normal to think that you may be born in your wrong body. It's not something I believe that is a thing. Um, we used to talk about this as there were you know people there were transvestites um, and and there were people with gender dysphoria who should be treated with care and kindness and and obviously um, receive mental health care and teaching a whole generation of children from zero at nursery right up until university that actually it yeah you may well be born in the wrong body if something if you feel a bit strange in your teenage years maybe it's because you are actually a boy you're actually a girl but you didn't realize that i i don't want my my child or anyone else's child told that i think that's i think that's dangerous i i think it's i think it's a, a a crime to tell children that that is a thing and that's something that that is desirable or or, or awful word but normal um, and not te treating that as a as a what it really is which is a, a a mental health concern for unhappy and disturbed anxious children mm. Do you, right, so do, you understand, do you understand do you understand why why I feel that way as a parent? Oh yeah, I totally see why you're saying that. But actually, trans issues haven't been uh, declared under uh, uh, as a as a mental health problem, according to the world's leading medical experts at the WHO. And also, I <laughs> oh yeah, because say... we trust the WHO. It, it used to be treated as gender dysphoria. That is the medical yes, definition. And, and... And when, when women went through the menopause, it used to be treated as hysteria. Things change and things develop. 
right? No, so but the menopause is... is no, you, you women literally sorry, do go through the speak? menopause. I did let you speak. Fair you enough, asked me enough. a question. I'm trying to... So what, what I would say is with trans issues, what is happening here is nobody is ever saying, you might be trans because you're feeling a little bit funny. But what they're doing is they're allowing people the opportunity to explore their gender. and no, they're, they're telling them you might be trans. In a way Trust me, I know what's going might... on in girls' schools. I, I was at one not that long ago and and i know what's going on and it's um it's it's a it's a, allowing people to explore their their themselves in ways lots of these things are extremely medicalized processes you can't just walk into a hospital and say i want that surgery it comes with lots of of psychiatric and medical no it doesn't testing. we know we know what was the hillary, hillary cast reported the tapstock which is the leading uh, gender dysphoria clinic in for children in the country she her report showed that actually no children were literally walking in and be given put on puberty blocker drugs very very early on often without parents consent they're on a long road to infertility and and body there is absolutely no damage. evidence to say that puberty but, blockers lead to infertility no, the, the, pu no puberty blockers are the first are the first start on the way down a very slippery slope towards uh children disfiguring their bodies and losing fertility which that's is, just not the case that that's is just the, not case. the case that puberty is blockers the case. Puberty that blockers prevent... Pub it's not the case. Puberty I'm blockers... Do you know people who have taken... Um, I, goodness me, I've interviewed an awful... No, there is absolute 100% evidence that actually once children are started down that route, they are very likely to end up going down a further route where they will actually have medication that will lead to infertility and, and, and many other issues with their bodies. Um, look, we could talk for much longer. I'm, I'm very happy to have you on the show. Um, let's do this again. Uh, but Shivani Devay, we have to leave it there. It